what's going on guys so i'm here with david and what we're going to start doing is talking about what makes a supercar owner a supercar how they got there and what they do for a living the day to day the misconception is that every supercar owner is just a multi-millionaire already they're just born with the lamborghini stuck in their butt and that's not the case over the next seven eight episodes we'll go in and talk to people some with money some who grew with money some who uh earned it you know busted their butt to get there uh david tell them a little bit about yourself welcome to the channel oh yeah great to be here matt thanks for coming out uh <laughs> yeah so i'm david um i'm originally from uh, wichita kansas um moved down here to dallas texas in about uh 2015 uh my brother moved down here in 2011 or 12 i believe so he'd been down here for a bit and i saw the success that he was having uh, i stayed behind finished up my four-year degree i have a degree in biology uh, i learned real quick after college uh, that if you don't have something lined up uh, your degree is the, at least a, a biology degree it's pretty uh I hate to say it, but it's a little useless since it's so broad. Um, like a lot of my friends are going to like medical school, pharmacy school, optometry school, and I thought that was something I wanted to do because that's what my parents uh, engraved in me since growing up. Um, stereotypical Asian household, um, but I learned real quick it was definitely not something I wanted to do. Um, I worked in a hospital, I worked in a plasma center, um, like you name it. Uh, and when I worked in the hospital, it was probably the best learning experience I got because that was pretty much real world just after I graduated. I think I was phlebotomist. Um, I made like, I think like eight bucks, eight bucks an hour or something like that. But I was, when I was making those eight bucks, I was working as if I was making like a hundred bucks an hour. Uh, so I would like talk to the doctors, nurses, and really experience what's going on. I learned real quick, that definitely wasn't something I wanted to do or like spend time pursuing to try to get into those like graduate schools and everything. So um, I was still working at the hospital and then my brother just kept telling me to come down to Texas, come down to Texas, you know, lost so much opportunity down here. And I, I eventually did in 2000, um, well, I, I actually I applied for um, to be a chiropractor because um, that was like the last thing. I was like, all right, I see myself doing the chiro being a chiropractor, and uh, I got accepted. Um, I went for my interview, put my deposit down, all my coursework stuff done in December of 2014. Uh, I moved down here in 2000, uh, January of 2015, um, and I was supposed to start in the summer. Uh, this was ongoing semester in, in uh, August or July, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I moved down here, I literally, I remember I just told, told my parents, like, hey, I'm moving down to Texas with my brother. Um, and my brother, keep in mind, he was living with his girlfriend in a one bedroom, like I think like a 600 square foot apartment mm -hmm. um, with two dogs that they had. Uh, and it was it was, it was was good for them. And then they were gracious enough to let me stay with them. Uh, I had no complaints. I was willing to, you know, do whatever they need to where, you know, I could help them out um, since they were helping me out so much. Yeah. Um, so I moved down here. Um, I put all my, I remember I put, I put all my clothes I had in the bag, in like just plastic bags. Um, I'll send you the picture. Um, I just put it in bags and I literally just threw it in the back of my Outlander just because I was like, eh, what if I got to lose? You know, I, I was just, I think part of it was being so young. I was a 24, 24 at that time. And uh, I honestly didn't know what to expect. Like, honestly, it was a little bit exciting in my, in my, in my uh, view as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved down here. Um, I told my brother, you know, you know, there's no need for y'all to look for like a house or like, you know, another two bedroom apartment or anything. I can sleep in the, in the living room uh, or I can sleep on the couch and everything. But I went out and I think we had like a leftover like air mattress. Uh, and then that's honestly what I slept on for a good six months uh, in their living room. So it was, and then I've also brought my dog down as well too. So it was three dogs in that small uh, apartment. Um, so I moved down there first. Um, and then I remember uh, in that apartment, it'd be a, I was sleeping in the living room and every morning morning I would wake up I had to put either the air mattress would deflate or I'd have to put it in the corner so they could like you know eat and go about their days and have the dogs run around and everything um and then um and then uh, I remember my wife then moved down um a month later and then you know she also was like you know just grateful to have the opportunity to like you know be in texas and move out of kansas and look for something um so she was with me you know sleeping on the air mattress putting up every morning putting out every night blowing back up um with our dog um so then while i was down here um i also my i also interviewed for a whole bunch of like sales positions so i got like a whole suit and tie i think i came down here with like a thousand bucks in my bank account mm -hmm. uh and then uh, out of that thousand two hundred, I went to Chase and Penny. Like I bought like you know whatever was on sale, like two suits, like the full thing with shoes, tie, all that. Um, 
And just to turn out, I hate wearing suits. Uh, right. <laughs> I hate wearing suits. Um, I did it just because, you know, I saw other people doing it, um, other successful people in my circle or what I thought was successful in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, but little did I know that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, so I interviewed for a whole bunch of sales position at you know, car dealerships. Um, I ended up turning them all down to work at Lowe's. Uh, I applied at a Lowe's and they really took good care of me for, they are like, yeah, as long as you know, put in the work and everything, um, we'll take good care of you. And that's what I worked at Lowe's for, I think like three, three months. And then while I was working there, I was learning like, you know, honestly, I learned more in that three months working at Lowe's um, than I did, you know, in school. Yeah. Um, I got to talk to people that had already been through everything, like giving me life lessons, like just learning like real world stuff that you actually use, like stuff that comes to real estate or like, you know, plumbing or fixing roofs or like and meeting all the, um, the customers that would come into, like they would tell me about like, you know, what they do. Um, and like why they're there at like six in the morning on the dot, like to, so they could beat like the crowd. And it was like sort of little clues, I think that, you know, gave me like different uh, uh, successful habits in life. Yeah. Um, so while I was working there, one of my things, like I learned real quick that they told, taught me was to uh, always keep looking for opportunity. So while I was working there, I actually kept applying on Craigslist. Um, Craigslist, I applied for every job you could think of. I was trying to put my biology degree to use at least, that's what I told myself. Um, so I would at least work until I would go to chiropractic school and make, try to do work there at the same time. But um, in the meantime, my wife got accepted into a nuclear medicine technology school out in Kansas City. Um, so that one really threw a curveball uh, in my plans originally because I thought I was going to go to chiropractic school and then, you know, she was going to find something to do down here because um, she also has a, a chemistry degree. Um, and she learned real quick too, like once you graduate college, like those degrees are it's hard to find a job with those yeah. degrees. Um, so she did that. So then uh, I ended up finding a, star- a job for a startup infectious disease lab here in Dallas. Um, and I met the requirements. I was like, hey, and this is off Craigslist. So I remember I went to the interview uh, like on a Saturday, uh, bef- and I was I remember I was late to my shift at Lowe's by like two hours because I was like, all right, I got this interview. She was, um, you know, uh, gracious enough to interview me at like eight in the morning on like Saturday morning uh, out of her busy schedule. So I skipped that. I, um, I missed work for two hours. I went there. Uh, did an interview and it was as sketchy as can be. Uh, I mean, it went to an empty building, you know, no lab equipment, random, you know, building in the, in the, in the just a, a medical building setting. And uh, yeah, the interview went great. Um, I the the thing that really set me off, I guess, that di- differentiated me from everyone else in that interview was there's um book smarts and then there's also like common sense smarts. Mm-hmm. Like you'll realize that real quick uh, in the world of like you know schooling and then education. Um, some people that are really like book smart, they sort of aren't good with their hands and just doing sort of everyday like just translating that into like everyday things. Mm-hmm. Um, and what really helped me land that startup job was working at the hospital, all this, um, you know, being able to multitask and triage in those settings where, you know, you're in the ER and you have to draw blood and you have all this crazy stuff going on at the same time. And you also have to work with whoever else is in there too. Yeah. Um, but it was just stuff like that that landed me that job. That was my first uh, lab startup job. And I honestly didn't really think anything of it. I sort of just thought of it as like another job. I was like, all right, putting my degree to use. And then as I started working there, I saw the opportunities that would come. Um, and the lab was, it's a, an infectious disease lab that um, we do uh, organ, uh, or we do uh, infectious disease screening for uh, organ donations here in Texas. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we test the blood for like HIV, West Nile virus, um, anything infectious disease related. So um, that started from a Craigslist ad. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to point out a couple highlights real quick. First, he said he was Asian. I didn't bring that up, so that was him. <laughs> uh, and he came here in a Toyota. Uh, uh, 2011, a Mitsubishi Outlander. An Outlander. It was an Outlander. With a bag full of clothes, <laughs> thousand bucks in his name, JC Penney's wrap, yeah, suit, yeah, and uh, whole bunch of student debt, uh, whole bunch of debt in general. So uh, you didn't come here in an exotic with a briefcase full of money. Oh, I wish that's okay. a dream. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. I just want to get everybody lined up to know that nowhere did you or your wife transport money <laughs> in an exotic car over here. You just, you, you're putting in the steps to get there. Yeah, I wish. And my wife, she came down here in a uh, 2007 uh, Honda Fit that uh, when we learned real quick, uh, that is not a practical Texas car uh, with all the holes in the road, the, the weather and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, definitely not um, any money or anything. Um, yeah, I mean, she was in debt. Um, as well too and i learned real quick when you get married uh 
you don't have just your debt. Uh, you, her debt becomes your debt. No, so it's, it's a, our debt. It's a combined <laughs> debt. Yeah, people don't realize that. Yeah. I actually had so much debt that when I got married to my wife, now I got her a prenup so she don't have to deal with my debt. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, she's protected from my debt and my, my responsibilities. I'm not protected from her. <laughs> so. so Lovely Texas law. <laughs> Good to know. I'll keep that in my pocket. <laughs> so what got you? So you started busting your butt. You realized you have a degree. You couldn't put it to use right away. So you didn't just, okay, screw it out. I'm just going to mow lawns or do something else. You, you knew you had an opportunity. And I mean, honestly, I wouldn't go on a Craigslist interview. I, well, I say that when I was younger, I went on a Craigslist interview <laughs> whatever there was another page and you show up and they're like okay and they break out a pyramid scheme almost, <laughs> oh, yeah. every, almost every time it's a period and you're dressed to the nines you know and it's a pyramid scheme uh but you had the the know-how or the not to be scared to just keep looking keep finding so but what got you wanting to go to a, like a look at exotic cars or into that world it's an intimidating world to go into it's <laughs> not just a Hey, I'm gonna go start buying Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and uh, I'm gonna just make a ton of friends. Mm -hmm. it, from my perspective, it was super intimidating to get into that world. What did you see? Oh, for sure, I was in the same boat. Like uh, moving back home in Kansas, you rarely saw any supercars. I think I maybe saw two Lambos the whole time. My whole time living there, like a Gallardo and maybe in like an Aventador uh, back mm -hmm. in like 2013, uh, and that's it. And uh, you know untouchable like no dealership ever carried them so like you literally it's not something that's normal but then i moved down here oh it's the norm you see on the tollway 635 yeah. everywhere and uh, it's very intimidating and then just even go to the car show sometimes and uh, to see everyone hanging out in front of their cars and everything it was very intimidating at first and i honestly thought i would never ever be able to get in one mm -hmm. um but then the crazy thing is you know you know when um when I was, I was applying for Craigslist, you know, like when you're so hungry and like you're so motivated, like it's an internal fire that you have. Like you, mm -hmm. you're willing to do anything that you um anything to you know just to get to the next goal. When I moved down here, I started hanging around more successful people that, and then I really learned like a it was like a different world. Um, I met you know people that had nicer cars, like and the nice to me at the, in those uh, at back then was like you know BMW, Mercedes, like you know S class, C class, stuff like that. Yeah. Um. And then once I started getting to that, then I started meeting people that had like, you know, Lamborghinis and like, uh, you know, with the Gallardo, I didn't really meet anyone like a Huracan, but like I met people like R8s, like, you know, people with, like 430s and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I realized, I was like, oh man, these people, they, they all told me one thing, like just keep working, like persistence, mm -hmm. show up every day, do your job, like you'll eventually get there. It may not be, you know, one year, two years, it could be five, 10, 30 years, but as long as you're trying, you know, you get I, there. I learned a common misconception that a lot of people that fail don't realize is you don't want to be the smartest person in the room, but you want to be smart enough to know you're not dumb. <laughs> Basically, you want to surround yourself by smarter people so you can learn and absorb that that intelligence, their way of life, their way of thinking. Some of it's just crazy, like some of the stuff you hear. And then some of it sinks in that like, oh my God, that guy's a genius. Yeah. <laughs> and if you surround yourself by unsuccessful people, you fall into an unsuccessful path. And like you said, you started hanging around guys with BMWs, Mercedes, and then the Lamborghinis came up and stuff like that. And if you would have surrounded yourself with the people, and I'm not downing anybody with the the Mitsubishi's, the Honda Fits and all that, because a lot of my friends today still have, you know, Chevrolet pickup trucks, Suburbans, Cadillacs, but you still got to have that outreach from my experience to reach out to these other guys. What made them successful, you mm -hmm. know? And it looks like you turned what you learned from your, your life lessons at Lowe's, meeting people and all your friends into hey, I can do this too, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, and that was one of the biggest mistakes I made was when I moved down here, I was really shy, very introverted. Uh, mm -hmm. Naturally, I'm not, but it's just, you know, different city and everything. But I, if I could go back in time, honestly, I wish I would have gone out and like met more people, network more, just, you know, just talk to more people. And I feel like I probably could have progressed where I am right now a lot quicker um, than how long it took me. Uh, Texas is a weird, weird state. And a lot of people don't realize this. My wife, she's from Florida. 
and she came here and she loves Texas and she's a social butterfly. She hasn't met a stranger, you know, she'll walk up, she sees a dog, can I pet your dog? <laughs> uh, we have the three dogs and two corgis in the palm. And you have corgis, right? Yeah, three corgis upstairs. Oh right? <laughs> yeah, so she's that way, but she's never met a stranger versus me, even though I do the YouTube and stuff like that, I can go into a crowd of people and not know anybody and I'll sit there just scanning the room wanting to know what these people are about for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And by the time I get the courage to talk to somebody, they're like, this guy's weird as hell. <laughs> you know? So I totally get where you're coming from. It's very intimidating here, especially for someone like me. I mean, I never dress like I have any kind of money because I always, in the back of my mind, want to remember where I came from. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to try to dress the part, if that makes sense. I don't want to go spend a thousand bucks on a t-shirt and some pants when I could have put two thousand dollars into my savings and invested it somewhere else mm -hmm. or bought an exhaust or tires or yeah. something cool you know I, I wear shorts I'll paint them to look cool or something you know <laughs> so what, what got you over the hump of you know just finally jumping in and saying hey I'm gonna go in and start going this supercar route, you know, because like we both said, it, it's intimidating to jump in and be like, ah, I'm gonna go get a Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, um, self confidence. Uh, so I started at that first uh, infectious disease lab startup. Um, I worked there for a good. Uh, I've been work, uh, worked at that one for a good like five years. While I was working there, I was um, also listening, you know, people like Grant Cardone, Gary V, like all these other, you know, very guys. smart people. Yeah, and I was like, all right, I, I got, you know, I'm young. I don't really have much, like, I don't have any kids. Like, I don't really have too much that's going to hold me back. Or if I fail, like, I can always get a job. But this job will always be there, and I'll always, you know, get out of debt and everything. Mm -hmm. So while I was working that job, I also started um, in real estate. So we did, you know, wholesaling, um, flipping. We did um, Airbnb, which is primarily what we've done, um, and we grew that to a pretty pretty decent portfolio and uh, made, did pretty well with that. And then with that, that's when I was like, I looked at my bank account, I was like, all right, I think, you know, we, we might be onto something here. Uh, so once I started doing that, I was like, all right, so I made a certain amount, and then I was like, all right, um, you know, what's... Like, I really want to step my car game up. I've been driving my Outlander for the past, like, I don't know, 10, almost, shoot, almost, almost uh, eight years. Um, so I was like, all right, I want something sporty. Um, so that's when I was like, I, could, I looked at it and I was like, really, that's it? Like, you know, um, it, the most expensive, that car I had was probably worth like 20000 I think. Mm -hmm. um, and anything, in, I'm from Kansas, anything that's like 40000 man, that's like a million dollars right there. Yeah. Like, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so you know, look at some of these cars. I'm like, all right, if I see this at 40000 and I started talking, I started looking up online, they're like, you know, it's better to get a car that um, that's used, that's you know has no, no, notoriety, I guess, over like an R8 or a Lambo, because um, it'll hold the values a lot yeah, better. Yeah, depreciation's gone. Yeah, and that's a big thing I didn't, I never learned about uh, growing up. You know, my you know my, my parents were also real estate investors, and you know my dad also worked a, at a production like plant job as well too. Mm -hmm. So um, they they just buy everything new just because. That's that's what that was their thing. Like they didn't want to buy anything used, um, and that growing up that was my mentality. But like when you transfer that like into like you know the exotic world, sometimes buying new isn't always the best thing because yeah. um, you take that depreciation hit like the first three years mm -hmm. and it can be a lot. Um, so I started looking at that. That's when I was like, okay, all right, I think I can do this. And then start saving up, saving up, um, and then I bought my first um, exotic uh, last year. Uh, actually, yeah, last year of August. Um, um, and I bought, yeah, and I, I, just, I remember I've been looking for R8s for about like two years. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do it. My wife's like, uh, you know, just we'll wait, we'll wait. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to do it. And then one day I was just like, out out in Grapevine, uh, Kenny yeah. uh, had one that came in. And then he t I came out there and then I walked, within like an hour or two, I think I walked out with, the, with a new R8. And I was like, oh man, that's crazy. Just Hold on, did your wife know? She did not know, actually. Uh, <laughs> I sent her a picture with me saying it's in the car, and then she was like, uh, what's that? And I was like, oh, it's our new car. And she was like, what? <laughs> yeah, so you asked for forgiveness, not permission. Right? It's to the successor. Right yeah, exactly. For fun, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So the RA came first. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a favorite color when you're looking at exotics. I've noticed that looking at your Instagram and all that. What color is that? Uh, my, my color combo I always try to get is the, uh, the red body and then the black wheels and try to do like a red slash carbon fiber interior. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So how, what, what'd you do after the R8 or do you still have it? Uh, so the R8, I bought that. Um, and then, you know, I bought it cause it was a, in my mind, it was a, 
looking back at it, it was a great entry level exotic car. Oh, yeah. It wasn't crazy expensive. I got you know everything I wanted out of that car, um, and it just taught me like how to drive. Because like, you know I come from like an SUV. Like I've never yeah. never like, I had a three thousand GT for like five, four months when I was like nineteen. That's a car that we flipped. Uh, me and my dad. Um, and other than that, it's been SUVs and the, the R eight group taught me how to drive. Like how to really appreciate the engineering, machinery, like everything about the car. Um, so I got that, um, and then I kept it, I drove it for a bit, and I was like, all right, you know, I sort of want to buy something else. I was in a position to buy something else. Um, and then a red um, 2008 uh, Ferrari F430 popped up, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, that's, that's really cheap for what it is. Or no, they, at first they listed it for like 120, and it didn't bite, um, so we, went back and forth like a whole month and then I got it down to like a hundred thousand I think and then they even put like a brand new seven thousand dollar clutch job inside of it and everything so I was driving the car practically for free um and uh so I bought I couldn't say no to that deal so oh I, yeah that's a steal yeah so I bought I bought that um and I had the R8 at the same time and I thought it would be and I had the same color combo red black wheels and I thought it'd be cool to have two exotics at one time but then I learned real quick especially with an our house with the two-car garage uh and we have we had like four cars at that time, and it, it's a hassle like getting it in now, mm -hmm. and like you have to drive it, every, and then it's it was it was a lot to maintain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what? Which one did you get rid of, or did you get rid of any of them? Oh, so I sold the um the four thirty right before um the the market crash happened. Um, so I cashed out on that, and then the R eight it was such a cheap. It, it in terms it was such a cheap car for me to keep on. It didn't really hurt me financially or anything. Like it was just I don't know, almost like a free car. Um, so I kept that one, and then while I was, you know, while I was keeping it, I always had a goal. Like uh, I call myself, um, I'm like a like a, you know, like you know, you hear like a, what is it the saying like a, when you're in college, like you don't, you know, you're like sort of like don't really know what you want. So like, do you like girls? Do you like guys? Like I don't know. I saw it like an American Pie or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sort of do did the same with like uh, with exotic cars too. I was like, I'm not sure if I like McLarens, Ferraris, Lambos. So I was like, I told my wife, I was like, let's try a little bit of everything. Uh, so we, we did the, the R8, uh, we did the Ferrari, uh, and let's do the Lambos. And then I never thought I could afford a Lambo because um, it was like a totally different tier. Yeah, it's a different level. Yeah, and it's little that I learned. How, yeah, it's it's one of the best you can get. Uh, and then it came up and I was like, all right, let's do it. And then it all worked out in our favor, favor, um, just randomly decided to buy and pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. So you scaled, you still have the R8? Uh, the R8 we traded it okay. for the so uh, lane book. The R8's gone, the 430, you sold that to somebody that's on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, uh, normal guy supercar, yeah. Yeah, so he sold it to a YouTuber uh, and then now he has uh, Lam uh, it's a Lamborghini, right? Yeah, yeah. What is it? What's the specs on it? It's a 2015 uh, Lamborghini Huracan. I got the 610-4, and uh, of course it's in the black, uh, or I mean uh, the red body and then black wheels, and I got the bi uh interior, so it's got like the red and um, and black uh, Alcantara and stuff. Oh yeah, that, that's a good looking car. So I've seen his car in person at meets and stuff like that. Um, in the drive, and I think it was a week ago, a week and a half ago, I'm going through Instagram. I try to watch everybody's story, especially people I, I know or I associate with or I see. And I start to see his story and it's old pictures he's posting. And it's an air mattress and one of them put up against the wall. And I'm like, what the heck? So I go to reading and I'm like, so this guy's a normal guy. Like some people think supercar owners or exotic car owners aren't normal in any way. And you heard him the struggles he went through, but the one thing you will hear is he never gave up. He never sat there and what was me or my degree isn't doing anything for me or I failed. And that goes for any industry, whether it's biochemist, doctor, nurse, uh, computer tech engineer, plumber, electrician, you're gonna have lows, probably more lows at some times than highs, but it's the highs you gotta remember or strive to get to in order to be successful like he's becoming or is right now in his field. And is this your last supercar? I mean, is this the, the I'm done, you know? Oh no, I want, yeah. I mean, now that I've had a taste of the Lambo life, like I want more. Uh, and you know, 
it, it, and I use these cards as like motivation, like, you know, I got the R8, like, but I, was, I always want like the best of the best. Like, uh -huh. you know, it's like an internal fire. It's like, oh, yeah. all right, you got level one, let's take it level two. Level two, let's go to three. So now I'm on a Lambo. Like, it's like, I got the Huracan, but now, man, after seeing everyone with the Perfumante, it's like, I want the Perfumante now. So it's, it motivates me to like, you know, work harder. Or do you save up and you get an event to go back? <laughs> yeah, right? Because those are coming down in price yeah, too. I mean, yeah. right now you can, a uh, Perfumante is around 260 and you can get a, a used Lamborghini SV or an S for I think last time I looked I found one for two fifty. Oh, see, that's crazy price. Right there. So I mean, at, at the end of the day, as a kid growing up, I always liked the Lamborghini, and you know, you're looking at the Countach, Diablos, Murcielagos as we're coming up, and you see the doors go up. So the common misconception: all Lamborghini door, doors go up. <laughs> Lamborghini's going away from that slowly, uh, except for their big line. And some people say, well, a Huracan's not a Lamborghini. I promise you a Huracan is a Lamborghini. If you've <laughs> ever owned one or drove one, it's a Lamborghini and it's a beast. Uh, so like you're saying, there's the steps. The So you get to the Perfumante, what's after that? Man, I think once I go Perfumante, if I, if I, if no, this internally knowing if I can work to get to that level, the Perfumante level, SVJ, that's the next step. It's, uh, it's gotta be. Yeah. Mine, mine in the Lamborghini realm right now is the SV. I don't know why, but the specs of the SV, uh, there's less SVs made. Mm -hmm. And the specs on them, they're supposed to be more comfortable, yet still just as agile around the track, but you lose the ALA. Mm -hmm. The ALA is and that's so, what I, yeah, so I, amazing. I wasn't a believer, but I see it in action. I was like, all right, that's crazy. I'm a believer. <laughs> the the one, the Performante I rented in Vegas last year, it was, it was crazy, the downforce. And you think, oh, there's no way this is gonna work. And you just feel it on the highway, about 100, 120 just starts sucking down. And it just, it's asking for more, uh -huh. you know? So I couldn't imagine when you get in the V12 going through that. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're not gonna stop. You're keep pushing for the S, the Performante, then the SVJ, but there's still more. Are you done after <laughs> SVJ? Oh no, I, if it's one thing um, I've learned, I've hung around other people, they're like, um, I've noticed like a lot of people that are successful, they're never, they're, never they're, they're happy, but they're never satisfied. Like they always have the internal fire that, you know, if you do one real estate deal, all right, let's do two, three, mm -hmm. let's do a bigger deal, let's, let's take it to the next level. Um, it's a hook. It is, yeah. And, and the average supercar owner, I don't know if you know this, is six months to a year. Oh, really? <laughs> so you own, on average, that's why if you look at some of the cars, you'll see like a Lamborghini Huracan had four or five owners from the time it was built in 2015 to buying it now. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're trading them up every six to 12 months. And it's crazy to me because you see that if I look at a, say a Chevy pickup, mm -hmm. a 2017, I'm like, this thing had seven owners? <laughs> no way. Something here, right? <laughs> no way. This ain't my car. You know, and you see it when you look at the Carfax and all that with the exotics and it's like, huh, it only had three owners. This is the one. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, it, it's a different, whole different realm. It is, yeah. Me, myself. The reason I got out of the Huracan, it's not that the Huracan was a bad car in any way, because speed of a Huracan and the feel of driving a Huracan is insane. It's hard to explain to anybody how the, how it feels until you've done it. Any of y'all that are out in Vegas or anywhere where you can rent one, I say save your money and rent one. It's worth the experience. But I went from it because, let's face it, I'm not a skinny guy. I'm not short. I just wasn't comfortable in the car. And I went to the McLaren the 720s i hated the 570 gt i had uh, and when i went to the mclaren i had someone ask me what's next and honestly in the supercar world i don't know this is the fastest one made right now i mean what do, what do you do right yeah. but i still love the lamborghini the aventador uh i mean do you go wait for the next mclaren do you save up and get your stuff right and do you get a, a senna do you get uh oh man that's crazy svj uh what else out there a p1 for center price right now you can get a p1 mm -hmm. the new 992 coming out yeah by porch no one considers them exotic but that zero, turbo cool. zero to 60 is 2.6 seconds yeah that's pretty nuts that's insane and they're conservative yeah. so no telling if it's 2.4 that's 
hypercar supercar speed, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, what do you buy next? Yeah. You know, so once you get to that SVJ level or the SV level, have you looked past that level? You know, I'm a big P1 fan. Um, I I would have to give a P1 a go, um, but yeah, I would have to, I would have to give a P1 a go. But I would also have to have like a third bank account uh, just for like you know the maintenance of oh, yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, Stradman's looking at the Bugattis and uh, the P1s right now. I'm hoping for a P1 uh, mm -hmm. mainly for his bank account, not for my bank account, because okay. Bugatti maintenance. Oh is, yeah, I heard. I follow Manny Koshman on uh, YouTube. He tells me to make, they talk about like the maintenance repairs they're done. It. It's nuts. It's like twenty thousand dollars for tires. Yeah. And I'm sitting here looking at tires. I'm like, they're not that bad. And you look it up. They have to be glued on. And then, <laughs> and then I found out after your fourth wheel change or your fourth tire change, you got to buy new wheels. Dang. <laughs> because you can't glue it anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna be in there with a Dremel. You know, like, I got this. We'll fix it, guys. So. So the P1 could be next. You investing in more homes, more real estate? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so right now, like I've this, I've never been like a stock market person, but uh, as of this year, I I had I had another friend that introduced me to the stock market, um, and it's been it's been it's been a crazy fun ride, uh, and I've been really enjoying it. So right now is the time to buy too. If you get in the right markets, every some things like the travel area is so low. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about the stock markets. I want to get into it, but it's everyone's saying buy, buy, buy. Mm -hmm. My luck, I'll buy it, and they'll be like, "Well, we're going back." We're the same boat. You need to. I want to learn it, and I noticed the house. Now you're remodeling your home you're in. Now are you gonna live in it, sell it, and go on to something bigger? Or? Yeah, um, yeah. One thing you know, my wife and I realized that we sort of like showed up every day to like the stuff that we've been doing like on the side, like the hustle and everything. Like you sort of, it's like, it's, life is like a game of monopoly. Like mm -hmm. you, if you, you know, if you start off in like a hundred thousand dollar house, you gotta move up to the 200, then 300. Yeah. Like you just have to keep moving up and up, up. And every time you move up, you learn something in between that, that gap. And uh, you start to understand the game and the intricacies a little bit more and the, how advantageous it is to keep moving up versus staying in one spot. So yeah, my wife and I are young and like, I mean, we're both 30, um, no kids or anything, it's three dogs. And uh, I mean, we, yeah, we're really trying to capitalize on everything that we can right now, so. That's the best scenario of life. As a 40 year old man that I've ever heard, I'm a business owner and I haven't invested my money in anything other than my YouTube, my business and things like that. Uh, I'm fixing to look into the real estate market because it's just so lucrative. And, it's a great learning experience to be in, in real estate, but to play it like Monopoly sounds, everybody strives for boardwalk and park play, <laughs> but in the game of Monopoly, we all start to go. Yep. And I mean, the way you're looking at it, life, you know, everybody starts to go and you never know what's going to happen. There's the, the rich families out there who they may lose that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, a tip I also always give everyone for you, invest in the stock market before you invest in anything like first buy a house like buy your primary residence you know go through fha you know low down payment payment assistance whatever you got to do buy a fixer upper get your foot that's your first foot in the door and that's a physical asset that you could have you can rent out the rooms you know you can airbnb it like something that it will help it, a lot of people think it's a liability but there's ways you can you know if you get it to make uh, produce income and then start there and then then you can you know you know, live in it for two years, sell it, don't pay any capital uh, or taxes on the capital gains. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lawyer or a financial advisor or anything like that. Disclaimer. Yeah, don't uh, sue him. <laughs> yeah, but that's stuff that I did. I started off in a two bedroom, uh, two bath, uh, twelve hundred square foot house at Whitehall Park. That's, mm -hmm. that's where I started uh, four years ago, two thousand sixteen. Yeah. Um, I had like I think I was making like thirty thousand dollars a year. I got I. Did whatever I could, maxed out my credit card, balance transfers to get into that house. And I think by the time I got into the house, there was only like, I think like two or three thousand dollars left in my bank account, and I was supporting my wife at the same time. Uh, but I knew it was just one of those things that you had to do at first, uh, just so you can get in there. And then we sold it for a nice profit two years later, and then this is our second one. And then yeah, we're just gonna keep keep going. We're not monopoly. Yeah. I just actually learned something, <laughs> and that's that's the thing about business and being. People nowadays, everybody's a lot of people nowadays think they're born with knowing everything, or they go to school and they think, Oh, well, this sometimes common sense will get you further down the road than education. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I, I strongly admire what you're talking about there with the uh, 
the housing market, uh, renting cars, heck, investing, you know. You're 30 doing what I should have been doing at 30. You know? So I'm, I'm 40 years old. Luckily, uh, heck, if you had mine and my wife's age up, we're the same age as you and your wife. Uh, but uh, she's got an older soul than me. So if we had in her soul, we're like 152 now. Uh, but it's support. I've noticed a lot in my life. As I turned 35 years old, I really started looking at life differently because I was I felt stuck and by feeling stuck I felt like I was in a rut I wasn't going anywhere at that time I was still trading cars like crazy but I was trading for the same level of cars and my dream was always supercars exotics blah 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 houses more money and money can't buy happiness in which I somewhat can see that but it's also kind of wrong mm -hmm. uh, because it's what you do with your money and how you treat the people around you. Agreed, yeah. Money can totally change you and make you a, sorry for saying, but it make you a prick. Yeah. Uh, it's how you treat people. That's the main key. But I was stuck in a rut and I met my wife now after going through a divorce and all that. And she don't let me stop. As it sounds like your wife don't let you stop, except for yeah. when you're going sneaking by a car and not telling her. And that's the thing, a partnership. You know, you got to have a partnership, somebody who backs you up, somebody who supports everything you're going to do. There's a lot of people out there. I have friends to this day that tell me, that's a stupid idea. Or that's going to fail. Mm -hmm. All that does for me is, okay, well, I'm going to just go do that right now. See, look, yeah. You know, <laughs> I got to hurry up and see if we're going to fail or succeed. You know, <laughs> I was told my YouTube would never take off. I was told what I'm doing in my personal life would never work out. Mm -hmm. And I've never been happier by going against the grain instead of just floating in the ocean with everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. I'm that fish going upstream. You know? <laughs> and, and that's the difference between people like, like yourself and you see uh, Graham Stevens, the Grant Cardone, the people like that you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, they're all just smart and they don't have a give up, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't either. And that's what this series is gonna be about, supercar owners. You're gonna meet some like you who came to Dallas, Texas with a bag and a Mitsubishi Highlander and what'd you say a thousand dollars in the bank thousand bucks yeah and slept on an air mattress to some of the people here are gonna be they just came from money and that don't make them any better or worse than david uh and i hope they realize it don't make them any better or worse than david because we all have a goal in life and we never know what's going to happen in life from my perspective if I mean, some people ask me, why would you waste your money on a car? Well, here's my theory, and it's proven today, today's day and age more than anything, and I want your aspect on it. I could go out right now and I could get sick. I could go to the doctor tomorrow and I could have cancer. I could have an illness, a brain tumor. I could have all kinds of things wrong with me, or I could just walk out in the street and get hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. So I leave behind a bunch of money, I have life insurance, so they're going to get a bunch of money anyways. So why not have fun with some of the money I do have mm -hmm. and enjoy the years I have? What's your take on that? No, I, I'm with you on this, in, the, in the same boat as that one. If it's one thing I've learned through the past couple of years, it's balance. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you can have all this money in the bank account and it can just like some people, that's just, that's like a game to them. Like just how much can they stash, stash away within their lifestyle? Like, you know, they're living in an apartment, still paying rent, which nothing wrong with that or anything, but like, you know, there's other things you can be doing. Um, and I, I were like, they have all this money in the bank account, but then their relationship with their wives or like, you know, you know, family, it's all, you know, all over the place. Um, yeah, or they'll, you know, drive like old cars, so like save money and all that stuff, which nothing wrong with that as well too. But like, yeah, my wife and I had the mentality. It was like, yeah, we've seen so many you know, of our parents and like, you know, family members like go through stuff like that where they just, you know, pass away with like money in the bank account. But that's, they're, they're not living their life. Uh, they don't have any fun. Yeah, exactly. Like my wife and I, my wife and I pretty much just do whatever we want. Like if you want to go on a trip, we'll just go. Um, oh yeah. yeah, watching your Instagram, <laughs> you show have pictures of y'all going somewhere and she's asleep in a Lamborghini. You know? it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the way to do it. You know? Yeah, that way we just try to find a balance. Like we both like are into like cars. Like mm -hmm. we're both into like business and making money and stuff like that. And just yeah, definitely if. 
I, 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 I would lose it if I if I would lo- were to lose everything all again. I would still be happy uh, and just work my way back up. Uh, but I've actually been a, a part of a divorce, and uh, there's actually a video on my channel about things I've lost and stuff. And I've been there. I've been to where I was. I lived in a eight thousand square foot house, or maybe it was seven thousand. Huge house, had whatever I wanted, and with that. I didn't. Uh, I didn't give up. You know, a lot of people give up, and you just can't give up on life. You give up on life, you give up on yourself. And to me, some people have the suicidal tendencies, depression, which I suffer from bad depression, even with being successful. But if you uh, have the suicidal thoughts, in my opinion, I get the suicidal stuff too. But you're only cheating everybody else around you by taking the easy way out. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, you hurt yourself for a little while while everybody else suffers from your your pain. So for sure, for sure. yeah, that, that's I, not fair. I, I've gone through the whole depression thing too about a year ago. Uh, you know, business is doing great, everything's doing fine, but I wasn't challenged. So like, I really went to just wake up whenever I wanted. Like, the, nothing really motivated me, and then I went through like a good month or two of that, and then uh, mm-hmm. I was like, man, something's not right. Like, I just woke up, I was like, I don't feel like it's me, and then I realized that's what I was missing. I was missing like, a good challenge, like something to something for me to work towards. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I've taken up enough of your time, and I feel like, honestly, I learned a lot. I hope everybody watching that does watch this learns a lot from you, and we're going to, like I said, do a series. There's going to be multiple going up on this, and uh, you're going to be my my opener, my highlight. And the reason is because just the way you came up, it's it inspires me uh, and I hope it inspires other people. But I did learn a, another valuable lesson today, bring my chargers for the camera. <laughs> and, uh, but we're good. We only lost one camera out of three. And uh, David, I appreciate it. Oh, no worries. You ever need anything, of course, you know where I'm at. And hopefully we'll do some more catching up. Maybe in a year we'll catch up and see where you're at. <laughs> I hope we sit down in a year and we're doing a video around your, your SDJ or something in your new home, you know? Oh yeah, and you need a new home's gotta have a bigger garage now. See, that's another criteria. I never really thought about having a big garage. Now I have to have one. You have to? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually building a bigger home now because I'm parking my Audi outside so I can park my McLaren and my wife's car inside. And it's like it's a different I, set of problems, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I get the whole what is it, first world problems yeah. or whatever it is now. So uh, we're building a bigger home for that. And there's always that person that motivates you, right? So mm-hmm. my house now it's double the size, three car garage, and my neighbor across the street has a modern home, six car garage, forty car collection. Dang, forty! Wow. He actually pays people. <laughs> to store his car. That's crazy. So hopefully I can sell all three of my cars <laughs> and make some money off it and I'll just keep three. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming out, or I came to you. I appreciate you letting us come out to you and uh, you sharing your story. Some people don't want to share stuff like that. And to me, I feel it inspires people. Oh, I'm, I'm in the same boat too. And then those that know, that know me, like I'm you, I'm the most normal person. Like all my clothes are from Costco. Like don't really spend a lot of money on appearance or anything like that. You would it's just, yeah, it's just an average person. It's just a regular shirt. I had <laughs> I gotten some dicky shorts. So yeah. most expensive thing I wear is my shoes. The only reason is because guy, you got to be comfortable <laughs> walking. But uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And it, uh, let's let's plan on a year from today. So what, what are we in July? We'll say August of next year. Yeah. Let's plan on seeing where you're at. And we might have to do it earlier because the guy moves fast. I mean, we're talking in a year, that's three cars. So we may have to do a three-month interview with him and see where he's at. So we'll see. Well, I appreciate it. And, guys, I'm going to put a link to his Instagram. Go look at his stories on there and see what see what we're talking about. It's really inspirational. So check that out. And uh, thanks again. Yeah, no worries, Ed. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,